What you hear is gathered out of the soundless vibrations of the air. And sound is there only because you hear it. The colors of the rainbow are gathered from colorless light. And you, so you see beautiful auras of color because you see them. They exist in your mind. There's no world of color and sound without the interpreting mind. For instance, a dog may hear all the notes of the symphony, but he doesn't hear any symphony. That's why he howls. It's painful. He just hears all sorts of sounds, but he doesn't hear music. Because music is in the mind. It's in the listener. The symphony orchestra that plays from this auditorium, from this platform, would actually be creating dissonances and cacophony that is terrible, and we wouldn't be able to listen to it unless we have a musical mind, unless we can understand. So the audience becomes a very important part of the experience. Without you, there's no music. It's important, you see. Alfred North Whitehead comments on this. He says, Nature gets credit, which in truth should be reserved for ourselves. The rose for its scent, the nightingale for its song, the sun for its radiance. He says, the poets are mistaken. They should address their lyrics to themselves and turn them into odes of self-congratulation on the excellence of the human mind. Nature is a dull affair, soundless, senseless, colorless, merely the hurrying of material endlessly, meaninglessly. But it has meaning because you have meaning and because you read meaning into it, because you exist, because you're there. So this gives a new insight into ourselves. We need occasionally, not egotistically, but in a great sense of appreciation to reach behind our back and give ourselves a nice little pat. You're all right. You're all right. Because you exist. And because you see things. And because you have the ability to see them in all sorts of diverse ways. Shakespeare had this tremendous appreciation of man. As in his Hamlet, he says, What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. Of course, this talks about the height of man's consciousness. In other words, the great spiritual potential that is within man. It senses something about the hidden mystery of God in man that Paul calls Christ in you, your hope of glory. It's a beautiful realization, but unfortunately, the full sense of these words have been predominantly lost throughout Christian tradition because we have been led to believe that Paul refers here to Jesus. When he says, Christ in you, your hope of glory, we, we usually assume that this means Jesus in you is the hope of your life. That isn't what Paul had in mind at all. Totally misunderstands the divine possibility that he's suggesting. Christ, you see, which he refers to, is not Jesus at all. Jesus discovered this dimension of the Christ, and therefore he was called, figuratively, Jesus Christ. But Christ is the God possibility within every person. It's the divine sonship. It's your hope of overcoming. It's your hope of healing. Your hope of growing and doing the greater things that Jesus promised you can do. But it's a depth of you. Not something that can be added on or put into you or something that you get just by believing in somebody else, even in Jesus. It's that which is the reality of you from the very beginning, the very foundation of your life. The book of Genesis says, God created man in his own image and after his likeness. Probably the most majestic statement in the Bible. God created man in his own image and after his likeness. Now the image is you as God sees you. And the likeness is that which you must work out in your consciousness and outform in your body and affairs. In other words, as we say so often, within you is the unborn possibility of limitless life. This is the image, and yours is the privilege of giving birth to it. This is the likeness. This is something that is your responsibility. It is your destiny to outform or to produce a likeness in the without of the divine image within. So the word image has new meaning. If you think of it in a loose interpretation, 
I am age, the I am age. Remember when Moses asked that voice within, whom shall I say sent thee, sent me, when he was being led to go to lead his people out of the, the slavery in Egypt? And the voice came back and said, I am that I am hath sent thee. I am is God. But I am is God experience within man. It is what we referred to last week as your eachness within the allness. The I am age is the divine possibility, the divine potential, the divine depth within you, which is always present no matter where you are in consciousness, no matter where you are in experience. So it's your destiny to produce the likeness, the outer manifestation of this I am age, so that you can become to experience an I amness in your relationships, in your life. Now, this is exactly what Jesus did. This gives us a new insight into what is going on in the New Testament studies. Theologians have said that Jesus was God become man. But you see, Jesus knew that God already had become man when he first breathed the breath of life into his own image, and it became a living soul. So the difference between Jesus and you and me was not one of the, man the manner of his birth, it was not because of some special dispensation. It was not because of some new potentiality that was in him that was not in others. The difference was in the awareness of that potential. The difference was in the consciousness of that I amage. Unfortunately, Christian tradition has supported this concept of the miserable sinner nature of man and the divinity of Jesus, which totally loses the full thrust of that which Jesus had to give to every one of us is a teaching. The heart of Jesus' teachings was not the depravity of man, but the divinity of man. The heart of Jesus' teachings was the I amness of every individual. Jesus discovered this principle of divine sonship. He discovered his own divine image, and he fulfilled the personal requirement of living it out into expression fully and completely, demonstrated in his own experience. So his ministry was devoted to the repeatability of the Christ. And that's a word that some don't like because of their traditional background, but it's a very important one. The repeatability of the Christ. Nothing shall be impossible unto you, he said. Nothing. And he went on further. He said, all the things that I do, you can do too, and greater things shall, shall you do if you have faith. So this certainly doesn't set him apart, you see. But it says that there is a divine possibility within every person. Jesus discovered it. This was his main role. He demonstrated it. He spent his life teaching other people how to experience it and showing the greater things that could happen if you do fulfill it and give it expression. Jesus said, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now why would he say this? If he did not believe that every person contained within him the same unborn possibility of perfection as he did, and that as Jesus himself had given birth to it, so could anyone give birth to it by commitment, by growth, by dedication, by work, by practice, practice, practice. I love the explanation given by Professor William Bateson, the British Society for Scientific Research. He says, We are finding now beyond doubt that the gifted and the geniuses of mankind are due not so much to something added to the ordinary person, but instead are due to factors which in the normal person inhibit the development of these gifts. They are now without doubt to be looked upon as releases of powers normally suppressed. Now he's talking about the genius, the phenomenal, the fast learner, that he's not someone who is exceptionally endowed, but he's someone who's releasing powers, powers that are within all persons, but which normally, by certain psychological complexes, are suppressed. This is a very important insight, because there is a particular genius within you. It doesn't mean that every person can do what other people do or become what other people become, because we're not in a popularity contest. We're not trying to be better than other people, but we're trying, as the ancient mystics said, to be better than our former self. The great competition is like a golfer on the golf course. He does not really playing with other people. He's playing with himself. He's trying to better himself, to better his skills. So it is with all of our relationships in life. So important that the great key is to know that each of us has more within us 
And growth is experiencing more of that more, releasing the powers that are normally suppressed. So you see, there is within every person, and let's make it more specific, there is within you, right now, the potential for what Thoreau calls the license of a higher order of being. That potential is within you. The license is always there. You don't have to go and get a license. You don't have to get the permission. You don't have to somehow get God in the right mood so that he will say, well, it's my will, you can now do it. Because God has already done for all of us what he can do when he created us in his image likeness. The potential is there, all built in, according to our uniqueness. But ours is the privilege of understanding it and releasing it and giving birth to it. And the license of the higher order of beings is already there. You have the license, you have the potential, you have the capacity to be more, to reach higher, to achieve the very depths and heights of your potential God self. It's always present, and ours is the privilege, and the time to begin to work at it is today.